Happy birthday, GameCube. You are 20 years old, which means not a lot, but it does make you a retro console. I'm holding this like a seven head. <laughs> and what does retro mean? With retro being defined as something that is two or more decades from the past. And if there's one video game company that absolutely loves anniversaries, I think our first bet would be Nintendo. And one of many, many, many ways that Nintendo loves to celebrate their franchises is through the classic editions of their previous consoles. So far, two consoles have been adapted into Wii Baby versions of themselves, chock full of selected titles that were deemed classic enough to be in the compilation, or at least Nintendo were able to get the rights for. Their first model based on the Nintendo Entertainment System had 30 games built in, 14 of which were by external developers, with seven third-party titles. And both consoles had their original Japanese Famicom and Super Famicom counterparts with a few different games chosen for the West. Since then, it's been pretty quiet with the classic editions of consoles, and it's not like Nintendo ran out of any, just even for the handhelds, we've got the original Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and Advanced to miniaturize. Well, maybe they can be normal sized, or maybe they could be enlarged to be fitted into the TV. I don't know. Anyway, with a little nod to the little big box that could, we thought to compile our own GameCube Classic Edition with 20 games that staff thought defined a generation. Sorry, 64. Maybe another time. <laughs> a little disclaimer just before we get into the list that we'll only be focusing on GameCube exclusives. And just for the record, we're going to assume that you can have up to four players and just whatever controllers, okay? Okay? It's, it's, all, it's all made up. Alright, let's go. This intergalactic high octane racing series pushed both player and console to its breaking point, with 30 races at any given time and 25 tracks to memorize. F0 was a tour de force in every aspect and in turn expected you to perform at its standard. While you play the part-time bounty hunter, part-time pilot, Captain Falcon, who at this point is probably more famous than the game itself. And ever since GX released in 2003, it has been the last console release from the series. At least old Captain Falcon still has his bounty hunting gig to keep him afloat until the next league. Oh, what a time it was to be a Star Wars fan at the turn of the millennium. Millennium. <laughs> At the turn of the millennium. Leave it in. A new prequel trilogy had just gotten into full swing, a new generation of kids had an IP to adopt their personalities to, <laughs> and Jar Jar fever was only ever rising. Life was good. And the timing couldn't have been any better, as the then present day tech was good enough to improve on the Rogue Squadron formula as it was debuted on Nintendo 64. The Rogue Squadron series was a flight simulation like no other, but allowed us to relive battles as seen on screen, in a vast array of environments from being in the fray during the battle for Endor to wrangling Atats on Hoth, not to mention the choice of vehicles to pilot. X-Wings, TIE Fighters, Snow Speeders, oh my! Wait, is that your dad's Buick? <coughs> because there was a tie between Rogue Squadron 2 and 3, I decided to ask those who voted for both of the games and see where the alliances lie. And the results are in and the winner is... Rogue Leader, which is the second one, and um, but it's fine, we'll just package both of them in because you know I've got contacts, my dad works Nintendo. I think we can all agree that nobody parties just as hard as Mario, mainly because everything is a competition with him, to the extent that he'll have multiple life size game boards with extremely dangerous minigames, all to flex on his friends and acquaintances, and quite frankly, this is all toxic behavior, Mario. And don't get me started on the health and safety violations. Though the series started on the N64, Mario Party really made a name for itself on the GameCube, starting with a fourth title and spanning a total of four games on the platform alone. There was always at least one copy floating around anyone's GameCube, with people's preference of version usually being what they owned, which in this case seems to be Mario Party 5, so in it goes. Wario is a complex and deep character with many layers to him. He's a garlic enthusiast, wealth hoarder, Game developer? Wario is the ultimate triple threat. Mega Party Games took the original Game Boy Advance debut and pretty much put it on the GameCube. I mean, if it ain't broke, just put it on the Switch. I mean, GameCube. From the ground up, WarioWare was a vehicle to play around with micro games, a rapid fire assortment of mini games in quick succession, giving you less than five seconds to prepare and complete them. All before you can comprehend what on earth you are doing. Did that log just moan after I broke it? 
And did I just play breakout with a watermelon and a businessman? A true artiste. Kirby is but one of many classic Nintendo franchises, and at some point, a popular IP must have its own racing game. And as such, Kirby's air ride sped its way onto the system. Just like in the mainline Kirby games, you suck up enemies and objects to gain their power. Another unique feature to this racer is the controls. We've been conditioned to use either the right trigger, the A button, or whatever face button is on the right hand side of the controller, just to accelerate. But this pink and round suck ball is a little bit of a lawbreaker, as Kirby's air ride is locked to cruise control, and instead the A button is used for braking, lawbreaker, braking, whatever. You've got three modes in Kirby's air ride too. Air ride, which is your standard third person affair with nine courses themed on the Kirbyverse, top ride, a top down version of air ride, and City Trial, an open battle arena situated within a city area. Something akin to a battle mode in other karting games. Not only is this a unique title as Kirby games go, but it's also the only Kirby game to grace the GameCube, which sucks. <laughs> like, like Kirby. <laughs> Fire Emblem Path of Radiance took the franchise into the third dimension, foregoing the Nintendo 64 and instead sticking around with the Super Famicom until 1999. What? After three back-to-back -back Game Boy Advance titles, two of which released in the West, and a little help from an unknown fighting series that is definitely not on the list, the Fire Emblem series really set the world ablaze, forging itself a new path down Nintendo's Hall of Fame. This, for many in the West, was their introduction to the character-clad permadeath fantasy-themed tactical RPG. With a rich story, 46 recruitable characters to bond with, plus an anime veneer, it's hardly any wonder how the series became as popular as it has become. Though it wasn't commercially successful, the reputation of this little title alone shone just as bright with glowing reviews and gained an audience as a cult classic. Though on the surface, it could be seen as something akin to a Resident Evil, Eternal Darkness deviated into the realm of psychological horror, having the player not only be aware of the health bar, but also its sanity meter. The special thing about the sanity meter being, as it depletes, Alexandria will slowly lose her grip on reality and be prone to auditory and visual hallucinations. And depending how severely sanity deprived Alex becomes, you playing the game will experience some technical difficulties, jump scares and control issues that only heighten what was already a creepy ordeal. Ah oh yes, Chibi Robo, <laughs> my little tin man. Not only the debut of the titular little bipedal Roomba, but also the only home console title in the series. Mistreated and forced to do things beyond its capabilities, does life imitate art or art imitate life? Yes, on top of doing general housework and chores around the suburban household of the Sanderson family, Chibi also has to contend with the destructive and chaotic forces in the house and the personal dramas of each family member. Even though that description didn't sound particularly advertising, I can assure you it is actually a lot of fun. We've got a video here on the Game Grin channel about Nintendo franchises that deserve a second chance. And your boy Chibi might be on the list. Who knows? Go check it out. What does Chibi Robo actually translate to? I mean, something robot, right? I could have figured that out by myself, but uh, I chose a robot to do it for me. So, uh... Pokemon. One of the biggest franchises on the planet, if not the biggest franchise, with the mainline series being exclusively tethered to handheld consoles. Everyone was eager and ready for a fully fledged role playing console experience. You gotta wait at least 15 more years until that's a reality. But eventually, we did get an attempt on the GameCube, namely Pokemon Coliseum. The game was not exactly the same Pokemon experience that we're used to. Instead of catching our own Pokemon in the park, we just stole them. To be fair, they were abused Pokemon needing a better home uh, inside my PC where they'll never see sunlight ever again. <laughs> The Colosseum didn't have the free roaming overworld that we were used to, and had a considerable lack of mon to pocket, the majority of us still took the game as it was into our hearts. And right into the storage box you go. Gotcha! <laughs> Star Fox may have begun on the SNES with this breakthrough Super FX chip and pioneered onto the Nintendo 64, but the GameCube was truly Star Fox's home base. Adventures was Rare's final title before being bought by Microsoft to do whatever this is and set a precedent to how to continue the series further. No longer was Fox McCloud fixed on rails shooting oncoming enemies, this was an action adventure game too. A Star Fox action adventure. Originally conceived as a completely separate video game for the Nintendo 64 called Dinosaur Planet, 
Rare took the concepts and ideas built for Dino Planet and fused it with the Starbox IP. Combat, platforming, exploration, new characters, and a deeper focus on story. Adventures took Fox and crew out of their comfort zone, but also breathed new life into the franchise. Or, at least it tried. Most fans didn't take too kindly to this new direction, as Adventures plays quite a bit too closely to a 64 Zelda title than it would resemble a Star Fox game. Still, the effort to expand the series was admirable, and made for quite a unique experience in the series. Nintendo isn't shy of peripherals. There's been at least one iconic piece of plastic per console, and the GameCube isn't any different. During the early 2000s, we had one of many convergences between the arcade and home gaming markets, and the Trojan horse, or donkey, was the rhythm action craze. As with everything Nintendo, they went to spin their wheel of IPs, threw a dart, and settled to make a Donkey Kong rhythm game. I mean, that's why I kind of assume what goes on in Nintendo. Wielding a bongo drum set with a microphone embedded into the controller, you are able to bash and clap your way through Nintendo's classic bops and licensed songs in Donkey Konga. I have a hazy memory of playing Losing My Religion by R.E.M. on Donkey Konga, and I just thought that was just a made up memory, but it happened. Many might recognize the layout of Donkey Konga, as it was made by the folks that brought you another drum rhythm game, Taiku no Tetsujin, who I'm led to believe hate their audience with how painful these games can be on the hands. But Nintendo didn't stop with just a rhythm game, but made those DK bongos just a little bit more worth your while with Donkey Kong Jungle Beat, a rhythm action platformer which might sound crazy, but in 20 years time, we'll see stranger uses for those bongos still. And Jungle Beat was a surprisingly intuitive experience. Smack the left drum to go left, slap the right drum to go right, hit both to jump, and pretty much every other move from stunning enemies to grabbing objects and walls can be done by clapping. And to think there was a bongo controlled racing game in the works. Barrel Blast was later retooled to support the Wii, but without those bongos. So let's swing from one primate to another. A lot of questions come to mind when you're discussing Super Monkey Ball. Why are these monkeys contained in these balls? Are they dangerous? Is there enough oxygen in these balls? All these questions and more will not be answered. <laughs> Just traverse the map, grab bananas, get to the end without plummeting to your death, and ascend another layer of hell. Though the series debuted in arcades, Ai Ai and his monkey pals roll onto the scene as a launch title for the Nintendo GameCube. Super Monkey Ball was a chaotically beautiful blend of a physics-based marble platformer and an adaptation of the skill maze game Labyrinth, but with a monkey doing some extreme zorbing. With such a unique mechanic, most developers would have just left it there and sold it as it is, but what makes the Super Monkey Ball series so good is the extra modes and multiplayer functionalities. The game alone has six additional features, three party games where you monkey race, monkey fight, or attempt a monkey amalgamation of ski jumping and darts, as well as some more ball related sports like golf, bowling and billiards. The second Ultra Primate Sphere implemented a single player story mode, and six more bonus games, monkey boat race, monkey football, Monkey Tennis, Monkey Baseball, Monkey Dogfight, Monkey Shot? You can't just put monkey on anything. Lucky for us, we've got a reboot in Banana Mania, with the first two Super Monkey Balls, plus the PlayStation 2 and Xbox's Super Monkey Ball Deluxe. How many times have I said monkey in this? I'm gonna need a monkey counter. Monkey Fight! Mario Kart has become a staple of the Nintendo home console, even if the Switch doesn't have its own unique Mario Kart title just yet. Double Dash was the first to tweak the formula with a sizable gameplay gimmick in the series, one that many people would like to see the return of in some way, shape or form. Two players, be it AI or human, could ride a vehicle in tandem, with the ability to switch between the driver's seat to steer and the back rail to throw and use items, lending a cooperative element to the game not seen before or since. My guess is probably because in co-op mode, there will be inevitably one player who doesn't get to drive as much as the other. Still, Double Dash lives on through legacy tracks and homages throughout the series. Most people had their first crossing of the series on the DS and 3DS. Though the game is technically a port of the 2001 Japanese exclusive Nintendo 64 game Daibutsu no Mori, Animal Crossing found its home overseas on the GameCube a year or two later. It provided a space for kids and adults alike to chill. All these games on the list are, in some way or another, quite intense and we were still in the marketing phase of everything being extreme and hardcore. Animal Crossing was a respite from the chaos of modern day life, with the ideology of finding peace and joy from the mundane, and was the most accessible thing we got to a Studio Ghibli slice of life. 
your little anthropomorphic villagers had a life of their own, outside of your perspective of it being a video game, attending events and group activities, watching them catch bugs and roam around the stores. It made you feel a part of this village, and that you too were a villager like them. Melee to this day is seen as the most definitive Smash Bros experience. It started the trend of jam packing the series with extra content like trophies, adventure modes, tournaments and clones. Outside of its cult status as the favourite Smash title through gameplay, Melee served as a tome for Nintendo knowledge, expanding on the character biographies found in its predecessor. Collecting these trophies was like reading into their history in relation to Nintendo and gaming as a whole. It was a celebration of video games as a medium, as a culture, as an art form, with a deep, rich history, all of which you could just eat. Like a lot of these titles on the GameCube, Paper Mario and the Thousand Year Door refines an original concept into what was largely seen as the definitive title of its respective series. The Thousand Year Door takes the best part of a role-playing game and trims the worst as scrap, subverting our preconceived notions of what we usually would expect from a typical Mario story, with multiple overlapping subplots as well as distinct chapters that feel very much like little vignettes or episodes, combined into a cohesive and satisfactory collage of a grander picture a bit more than what we would have expected from a paper plumber RPG. This all makes you, as Mario, feel like you are a part of a larger Mushroom Kingdom, a world of eccentric personalities, characters, stories, and gameplay elements throughout, providing a greater sense of journey rather than speedrunning and platforming to another castle. <laughs> also, there's a Goomba called Goombella, which is just fun to say. Goombella. There's a sense of innovation that Sunshine and other GameCube titles share. Yes, Nintendo could have given what all of us wanted at the time, more of the same old, Super Mario 64 but better, Mario Kart 64 but better, Mario Party but better. Mm -hmm. And seeing the list of things that Mario gets up to, it's high time Mario had a little island vacay. What could go wrong? Basically, Mario gets profiled for wrecking Isle Delfino before he even gets there and is immediately thrown into jail, spending the rest of the game doing community service. You'd think as a plumber who regularly uses pipes as modes of transport that he might have Shawshank his way out of there. But no, I guess it's not the Mario way, because eventually he acquires the flooded sentient water gun rocket belt combo and a terrible acronym. The Flash Liquidizer Ultra Dowsing Device. Was Wetpack not cool enough? Wetpack is also an acronym. <laughs> water emitting tank propulsion and cleaning kit. I got it! The sunny tropical Hollybob vibe left a big imprint on the Super Mario series, spilling over into other games throughout the years, and it's one of the most self delfining features of the Nintendo catalogue. The Legend of Zelda has been a staple of Nintendo history and gaming culture since its debut in 1986. Though the general structure remains the same, each entry in the series has made efforts to expand and innovate gameplay around a familiar narrative framework. For the most part. I guess that's worth a kiss, huh? Ha! Huh. I won! After the success of Nintendo 64's Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask, as well as the GameCube on the horizon, everyone and their cave-dwelling hermit grandparents were eager to bear witness to the next Legend of Zelda title. And at Space World 2000, we got a glimpse of a Zelda tech demo running on the GameCube. It seemed as though the series was gearing up to go further into the dark medieval fantasy aesthetic set by Oot and Mmm, and fans were hyped for what was in store. Two years later, a gorgeous, cell shaded bright and airy, good old fashioned sailing adventure arrived on port, carrying with them the dark clouds of what could have been from the aforementioned tech demo trailer. Just wait four more years, you'll get your gritty dark Zelda soon. Those who gave Wind Waker a chance were rewarded with a grandiose seafaring adventure, an expansive open world with incredible charm and personality. I mean, how could you hate this game? Just look at Link's little face! Wind Waker was a beautiful balance between being faithful to the classics that made the series, whilst progressing the franchise into new waters, that being a cartoon version of Waterworld. And 15 years later, we saw that same philosophy translated again with Breath of the Wild, taking the best elements of the series thus far, whilst being its own distinct game. You'd think with the success of the Mario Bros series, that our boy Luigi would have his own mansion by now. All those royalties he's owed, probably lost it all during the year of Luigi. It was tough times. But Luigi hasn't always been the highly strong handyman that he is today, other than just being Mario's brother, or second player. 
If my only defining features were my weaknesses, my phobias, and constantly being in my brother's shadow, I think I'd soon intend it for defamation. If only I didn't have a fear of litigation. <laughs> Luigi did finally get the chance to start in his first game. That wasn't Mario is Missing for the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. The less said about that, the better, because in Luigi's Mansion, Mario is missing. Yes, your brother is in grave danger after you win a contest to win a mansion. A contest you didn't even enter. Mario, being the punctual plumber that he is, arrives early and then is trapped within a painting that he can't get out of. Steps him right for wandering around people's homes and climbing into their portraits. It's good that he learns that lesson now before he triple jumps into the Mona Lisa or the black paintings of Goya. With the help of Professor E. Gerd and his modified backpack vacuum cleaner, Luigi reluctantly sets off to suck up the spirits before the real estate agents come over to appraise the house. I mean, before anything else happens to Mario. I'm not surprised that after his near-death experience, that Mario would just want to escape to a holiday resort island far, far away. I'm sure nothing will go wrong. In the transition from 2D to 3D, Mario found new footing in Super Mario 64, Link spinned a new tail in Ocarina of Time, Donkey Kong 64 brought barrels of new fun to DK, and even F-Zero made the dimensional jump, though there was a feeling that someone or something was absent. Metroid Prime, the 3D counterpart to the Metroid franchise, was possibly omitted from the 64 roster due to technical limitations in implementing the eventual idea and scope that will become the Prime series. As you see here, Metroid's subgenre sharing cousin Castlevania did not take to the extra Z axis particularly well. We wrought on ourselves in pursuit of perfection. But all of those bounty hunter abilities are here. Blasting, jumping, the grapple beam, becoming a ball, and new features like scanning objects and critters for more information like your own personal Microsoft Encarta. Or I guess, smartphone. Visually, the Prime series still hold up compared to their realism-heavy contemporaries, and the iconic design of Samus' helmet isn't lost in the first-person perspective, as the HUD and visor frame neatly wrap around your view. And the third dimension adds another level of detail when it comes to various combats and puzzles during unique boss fights. After a decade and a half of waiting, I think we're all Metroid primed and ready for return of the series. So that was Game Grin's choice of 20 exclusive games that we'd love to see on a hypothetical GameCube Classic Edition. It'll come in two colours, Game Grin Gold and News Post Navy. We've actually got another GameCube video coming out soon about the deeper cuts of the GameCube exclusive library all of which did not make the cut, but I wanted to make a video about them anyway. There were still a lot of games that got cut. The fact that we had to squeeze in six games into the list kind of shows how many games, how many great games were on the GameCube. Did you agree with the general consensus of our staff? Did your very game not make the set list? Voice your opinions down in the comment section below. We'd love to hear you. Hit the like button and please subscribe to more content along with podcasts, reviews, and other little treats just to feast on, just like this.